Buon pomeriggio e ben ritrovati, benvenuti al webinar di oggi. Il webinar è Understand It First, a cura di Roy Norris. Roy Norris ormai lo conoscete, è un nostro autore da tanti anni ed è un esperto di certificazioni, in particolare appunto di FIRST. E, mh, alcune comunicazioni di servizio prima del, dell'inizio del, del webinar. E, come sapete, durante la presentazione potrete compilare e lasciare le vostre domande o commenti a cui poi Roy eh, potrà rispondere alla fine della presentazione, per alcuni minuti, insomma, quindi a fine sessione. Ehm, inoltre riceverete, eh, dopo naturalmente il webinar, un'email um, un, un con um, alcuni documenti diciamo, da compilare, un questionario, scusate, un questionario da compilare, dopodiché riceverete l'attestato di partecipazione, nonché un link da cui scaricare degli handouts, quindi del materiale che Roy ha gentilmente messo appunto insieme per voi in modo da poter approfondire il discorso eh, sulla certificazione di FIRST. Eh, ringrazio naturalmente Roy Norris, ringrazio Macmillan Education e Mondadori Education per questo webinar. So Roy, thank you for being here, it's a pleasure, it's an honor, and it's over to you now. Okay, thank you Silvia, pleasure for me too, and uh, hello everybody and welcome to this webinar which is entitled Understanding First. Um, it's specifically aimed at teachers preparing students for the first exam. And if you're one of those, then it's very important that, that we understand how the exam is put together, uh, what's tested in each of the tasks and how it's tested, and also what some of the difficulties and challenges are that students face in the task. So we're going to be looking specifically at um, tasks from the reading and uh, use of English paper and also the listening paper and looking how it's put together and also offering some solutions, uh, activities, ideas, procedures that you can use in your classroom to make students aware of those difficulties and challenges. So I'm going to uh, switch over to the presentation now um, and you won't see my face until the end. I'll come back in and uh, answer any questions that you may have. Okay, so a little bit of a delay. Whoops, no, while I go into uh, the presentation, I have to do something here first, sorry. And onto the presentation. Now, now you should be seeing that there in your screens. Uh, understanding first, Roy Norris. Okay, so um, the first thing we're going to do is a, an activity which is going to be on the handout which you'll be receiving and um, related to open close, a kind of a warmer if you like. It's an activity that I uh, do with, with students. I teach in Madrid. I'm, I'm talking to you from Madrid and I teach in a secondary school in Madrid. And I, in fact, I was using this very material just yesterday with a group of students, 20 students who are preparing for the exam. So I'll We'll go through the activity, then I'll tell you what it's all about or why, why I do this with students. So you've got uh, four sentences there. On the handout, there are eight, but we'll just look at four of them. And quite simply, all you have to do, and what I do with students, is I put this on the PowerPoint and ask them to shout out the first word that they think that fits in the gap. And I do encourage them just to shout out spontaneously. Uh, so the first one, we enjoy the holiday, but sometimes it was mm, windy by the seaside, and most of them shout out uh, very and I put very up there, some say quite, others say two, and that's about it. Then the next one, our room overlooked the motorway, so it was very noisy. It was, and a couple of seconds to think about it, and they usually come up with not a good hotel. Third one, I thanked her very much for the jumper. It was mm, the right size. Some say exactly, and some say just. And the last one, at least on this screen here, mm, days you can get to the capital in less than an hour, not always, of course. Um, most is one of the answers, many, some, and even yesterday there was the word these days uh, was also mentioned. Uh, one student actually said nowadays, and I had to point out that that's uh, obviously uh, not going to work here. Okay, and then I, after I've done that and they're shouting out and they're all happy and they think they've got the right answers, um, then I say, well, I'm sorry, but you've got them all wrong. All those answers are wrong because you didn't read all the context. And the reason you didn't read all the context was because I didn't give it to you. So then I show them what I mean with this sentence here. We enjoyed the holiday, but sometimes it was windy by the seaside. We go back to that one. And then I say, I'm going to give you a little bit more context this time. And then 
you tell me what the right answer is. And I show them this. We enjoyed the holiday, but sometimes it was windy by the seaside that we could hardly walk. And the answer is, that's right, so windy. Okay, and then I give them a sheet, uh, a sheet with, with these sentences on. In fact, with these sentences on, and again, there are eight of these, but here are just four. The first one we've done at the top, uh, so windy. And then we look at the next one. Our room overlooked the motorway, so it was very noisy. It was ooh, a good hotel, though, that we've decided to stay there again next year. So it moves from a negative to a positive, and there such is the answer. And then the next one, more context at the end. I thanked her very much for the jumper. It was the right size, however. So I asked her if she could change it for me. Uh, it goes to a negative, and that's the answer there. It was not the right size. Other students try other answers. One student yesterday said, almost. It was almost the right size, however. And I pointed out that probably if you put in almost there, you'd expect something more positive, like it was almost the right size, so I decided to keep it. So this is the answer there, not. And then the last one, in those early days before train travel, the journey to London used to take all day. These days, you can get to the capital in less than an hour, and so on. Uh, these contrasting with those in the first sentence. And that's the point here. The point of this exercise is to show that uh, students for this, one of the difficulties of this exercise is that students often put in the first word that seems to fit without reading to the end of the line, or as in number four, without reading the sentence before, or sometimes without reading the whole uh, text before. And as you'll know, that as soon as you give students an open close, they'll start to try and fill in the gaps without having read it through first. So this exercise is aimed at encouraging students to really take on board the idea that they need to read through the whole text first before they do any, any gap filling, and also that they need to look very carefully towards the end of the sentence, the beginning of the sentence, the sentence before, the sentence after, when they're deciding which words to put in. Okay, that's one activity you can use. It's on the handout. You can have a look at it uh, there when you get it and see if you'd like to use it with your students. Uh, and I, but I think it does make this point very well that uh, it's important to read more than just the word before or after the gap. Okay, I'm going to go back to, I'll come back to open close and use of English later. We're going to start with listening now. Um, uh, we're going to spend quite a bit of time on listening. It's an area I think students, students have or feel that they have problems with anyway, and I think we can do a lot of uh, help for students, uh, help students a lot here. I'm going to look at, start by looking at part four, um, um, part four listening, and I've got some questions for you. So here are those questions. Um, how well do you know the first certificate? What type of task is it? Multiple choice, multiple matching, sentence completion. How many questions are there? How many points are awarded for each correct answer? How many speakers are there? How long does the part four listening last? Probably okay so far, or hopefully okay with those. And then how many words are there in the script? Hmm. How many words are in each speaker's turn? Well, perhaps you're gonna have struggle with those uh, questions there, but they're actually more for me. I'll tell you more about those in a minute. Anyway, those initial five answers, here they are, it's a multiple choice. There are seven questions. How many points are awarded? Well, one point for each correct answer, as with all the listening. There are two speakers in the past, before the 2015 exam, it, there could be three, but now there's just two. How long does it last? Three to four minutes. And in fact, as we'll see, it's usually closer to four than it is to three. And I've never seen a part four listening lasting any, anything less than three and a half minutes for reasons we'll see later. How many words are there in the script? Well, that's more for me to know, uh, being a writer of this kind of exercise. Um, but I'm going to share that information with you. Um, how many words are in each speaker's turn? The same thing. I'll share it with you in a minute. Here is a script. Don't worry, I'm not expecting you to read the script. Um, but it's uh, a part four, four minutes. It's a continuous text. A lot often students kind of worry, get worried about this. It's it's a long period of time to be listening to to one listening, um, and for that, that's one of the difficulties or challenges that they face with this exercise. 
But let's have a look at how it's structured. If you, if you look closely at it, you can see there are two people. There's an interviewer and an M, interviewee. He's called Mickey Smith. And if we look closely at that, we'll see that there are actually seven different terms. There are seven questions and seven answers. Seven questions from the interviewer, seven answers from the interviewee. And in fact, what we have there is seven mini listenings all joined together. Um, yes, OK, it all runs on for four minutes. But I think this is a kind of information we should share with students that there is usually this structure. It's question, answer, question, answer. And for each answer there, uh, that the interviewer gives, interviewee gives, sorry, there's a question, a multiple choice, choice question that students have to answer. Um, and this can be very useful if they kind of get lost and they think, well, wh which question am I on now? Where, where should I be? When they hear the interviewer come in, usually it means uh, that they're on to the next question. It's a piece of information worth sharing with students. Also worth pointing out that, you know, since 2015, I've looked at uh, no fewer than 28 different listening, part four listenings from Cambridge, from the handbooks, from the practice tests, and only two of them follow a slightly different pattern where maybe the interviewer comes in and says maybe one word in the uh, interviewee's turn. And of the 56 listenings that I've looked at over the last few years, before and after 2015, only a total of three were any different to this pattern. So information, I think, worth sharing. Um, the length of the listening is 650 words, and that translates as three minutes, 53 seconds. Uh, and that's the usual length of a listen. You don't have to tell your students it's 650 words, uh, more a point of interest for you at this stage. But yes, it's usually four minutes. And the long turns, that's Mickey Smith's answers. You'll know that's the number of words in each of his answers, 75, 66, 79, and so on. And you can see from that, and probably you can see from the actual listening script itself, that it's very balanced. It's usually... Uh, each each of his turns is usually about the same length. And there's a reason for that, um, which we'll have a look at now. This is the, the first question. Now I'm going to play this. Uh, this is the interviewee, sorry, the interviewer asking the first question at the beginning of the listening we've just been talking about. So have a listen. Today on the programme, we have Mickey Smith, author of the book, The Power of Practice. Mickey, in your book, you talk about what makes a champion sports person. Your argument is that talent, a natural aptitude or skill, doesn't exist, right? OK, and here is uh, Mickey Smith's answer with the question, which I'll just read out to you. When asked about his theory on talent, Mickey says that he is doing further research with other people, A, or B, he realises some people disagree with him, and C, he has not yet fully proved his ideas. Have a listen and decide what the answer is. Right. I know that's controversial because it's thought that people are born with natural abilities. I have my critics, but the evidence from research I've done backs up my argument. If you look at anyone who's reached a high level in any complex task, you'll find they've spent many years building up to it. This has started other people thinking and doing their own research. I've no doubt they'll reach the same conclusions I have. OK, and hopefully um, you'll have come up with the answer B. He realises some people disagree with him. And there's the part of the text highlighted that gives you that answer. Uh, it says, I have my critics. I know that's controversial. And notice here what this is a challenge for students of difficulty is that the answer comes right at the beginning of Mickey Smith's first term. Remember, this is the first question in the listening. It's the first time they hear Mickey Smith and it's the first words that he says. So students have to be tuned in right from the very, very beginning. And this kind of where the answer comes at the beginning of a turn uh, can cause problems for students because they're not listening 100% at that point. So they need to be told, they need to be alert both times they listen and listening to everything they hear uh, for, for, the, for the right answer. OK, that's the, the right answer, but it's also important to look at the wrong answers, uh, the wrong answers A and C. And if you'll, you'll see there, I've got the A highlighted in red. He's doing further research with other people. Look at the part of the text in red which says 
This has started other people thinking and doing their own research. There's the distractor. He's not doing re research with other people, but other people are doing research. So there's a very tempting uh, piece of language which might tempt students to answer A here. And C, he's not yet fully proved his ideas. Well, quite the opposite. The evidence from research I've done backs up my argument. So it's the opposite. They're talking about uh, whether it's proved or not. And the point here is, well, back to the number of words. I said that, that you needed a certain number of words here. It needed to be a certain length. It needed to be nearer four minutes and three minutes in order to, for writers to be able to work these distractors in. And very usually, very often, um, the wrong answers do have something in the text which makes them tempting. So what we need to be doing as teachers is not all the time, but now and again, once we've done a listening, whether it's a part one, two, three or four, is look at scripts, analyze them, see where the um, distractors, how the distractors are work in, worked in. And this will help students become aware of how they're structured and therefore have a better understanding of the exam and therefore be much better prepared for it. Um, and as I say, it doesn't have to be done all the time, but once they've done a listening, have a look at it, analyze it and see how it's how it works. Uh, okay, back then, th there it is. There's the, the script again. It's actually seven mini listenings like the one we just said. And in fact, each of those mini listenings, if you like, is about 35 seconds. Seven times 35 is just over four minutes. And it's really like seven part one listenings. Those of you who know the exam well will know that part one, each listening, each of the eight listenings lasts between 30 and 40 seconds. And that essentially is what you've got here. It helps to demystify the listening if you tell students that. Um, and if they know that after each intervention from the interviewer, there's going to be, sorry, yeah, the interviewer, the interviewee, there's going to be a new question uh, being answered. This is what the Cambridge Handbook says um, as far as advice on preparation for listening. Very interesting. It says that students should know when to stop concentrating on a question which they are finding difficult so that they don't miss the next question. Well, it's very good advice, but how do they do that? Well, with part four, that's how they do it. Uh, from, from what we've just been saying there, they know when to stop concentrating on a question when the interviewer comes in with their next uh, question. And the other thing the handbook says here, students shouldn't be distracted by individual words and phrases in parts one, three, and four. They should listen to the whole message. Exactly, listen to the whole message both times from beginning to end and be aware that there are distractors so we can prepare them for that by looking at uh, scripts and seeing how they're put together. Um, and you can use the ones in the handbook. Uh, if you don't have practice books or uh, use, use the actual Cambridge uh, listenings, which is where I'm taking a lot of this material from this webinar today from. Okay, part one I'd like to look at now. Similar thing, um, part one, there are this time there's multiple choice, but there are eight different listenings. Here's a question. You hear a man talking to a friend about a TV series. He's watching. The man is impressed with the soundtrack, the acting, or the plot. Well, I can tell you the answer is the plot. Let's listen um, to the script. I'm just going to move this out of the way. There we go. And that will help you see the whole script. OK, let's play it. Unit four, part one. One. You hear a man talking to a friend about a TV series he is watching. So how many episodes did you watch last night? Three. It's addictive. I'll say that for it. I knew you'd like it. Well, yeah, it's OK. The writers have done a good job with the storyline. It draws you in, makes you want to keep watching, like a book you can't put down. It's a shame about the actual script, though. I mean, the actors do their best with the lines, but it all sounds a bit unnatural. And the music's nice too, but I really don't understand why they've used recent songs in a series set in the 1920s. Okay, I hope you... Oh, I have to turn that off now, just a minute. So how many episodes did you... Yeah, there we are. Okay. Um, well, the first thing to say about this, I mean, it was maybe a little bit quiet, but hopefully you could hear it. It was that that wasn't a professional sounding uh, listening because it was recorded by myself and a colleague. And uh, the first point I wanted to make was that all the listening material that I write from, from my books 
I, I pilot. I record it with colleagues and I pilot it myself or ask other people to pilot it so that it's uh, we, we, we test it out and make changes to it if necessary. And actually, this one is I've been piloting and there may be some changes I make to it uh, later. But here the point is, notice how the plot, the, 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 word, the answer, the plot is not mentioned in the script, they mention the storyline. Once again, the answer comes at the beginning of that long turn, which is a difficulty in itself. And then the word, the plot is paraphrased and, and the word storyline is used. Uh, the same with the soundtrack, uh, music is mentioned, um, not the soundtrack, so students don't hear it. Whereas actors and acting, yeah, there's a very similarity there. And that makes that, that actual answer very tempting. So Students should be aware of word spotting. If they hear a word that sounds like one in the options, it's not necessarily the right answer. Um, and they should listen out for other words for those prompts. It won't, they won't hear the same words necessarily in the script as are in the prompts. Also to point out is the fact that the, the distractors there, the actors and the music's nice, um, uh, are positive they're introduced in a positive way actors do their best with their lines the music's nice too and then you have this but which is used there and often distractors are put are included using uh contrast linkers like but however and although and so on something to look out for as you look at scripts like this um and i just said that you know if the word is in the script it's not necessarily the answer as with acting and actors Last. oops yeah but beware uh, because sometimes it is uh, here's an example you don't have to read this um, let me just point out to you that here uh, the club's doctor who has suggested a change in clubs policy club policy of a football club the club's doctor is paraphrased by medical experts the club supporters by young fans and the club's new manager is actually mentioned in the text as the new manager of the club. And it makes it very tempting. And in fact, here, it is the right answer. The new manager of the club has banned the players from eating meat when they're preparing for important games. So be very careful about what you say to students that if you hear the, the option in the script, that's probably not the answer. No, it might be the answer. There's nothing you can say definite about this. Um, as you can see from this example, which also comes from the handbook. Okay. Um, all right, no, another thing. Another thing about part one, something I've noticed since 2015 now is that there is usually uh, this type of question. You hear two people talking about the twice weekly fitness class they both attend. What do they agree about? And there are three options there. Um, this, what do they agree about, relies on you and means a student has to listen carefully to both speakers and see what it is they agree about. And there is usually one of these, not always, but very usually in part one, one of these, this type of question. Sometimes two, even three. And in one case, I've seen a whole uh, part one listening paper from Cambridge with no fewer than four agree questions in it. So this next activity is, is going to be on the handout. You can have a look at it, use it with your students to make students aware of some of the kind of distractors that are used in this kind of question to tempt students to answer the wrong one. And in this, this activity, it's an activity, there are all of those options are wrong. OK, this is uh, getting them in, uh, to be aware of how distracted distractors are built in. Let's look at the first one. A, there is not much variety. Students will pick out hardly any variety in the classes. And then the woman says, yeah, there seems to be agreement. But then if they listen closely, they will hear last year it was so boring. There was hardly any variety in the classes. Talking about last year and the woman agrees. But we're not talking about this year. What students do is they, uh, they read these different scripts, these different extracts, and discuss why those options are wrong. Here's the next one. There are too many students is the possible answer. And the man says, there are always too many people. And the woman, I know it's annoying. But again, listen more closely and you will hear that there are always too many people talking, which is not the same. And she agrees with that. OK, so that's not exactly the same as what it says in the option. And the final one, 
there's not enough equipment. Man says they should get some more equipment. And she says, I agree with you. Or at least that's what the students might pick out. But if we read or listen more closely, uh, she says, I'm not sure I agree with you. Uh, as a negative. So it's a sensitization process, an activity to sensitize them to the fact that they might hear this kind of distractor in the part one listening. Okay, that's on the handout if you'd like to use that with your students before they do a part one listening with this type of question in. Finally, uh, on the listening section, at least uh, part two, part two also has distractors. There are distractors in all, all the different parts. I'm not gonna play this, um, but the first question of this one, which is also from the handbook, says Chris thinks the best place to find a job like he had is the mm. And if you read it, Hello, my name is Chris Graham. I spent my last vacation working in Australia. The place I was in was a popular tourist spot, so there are lots of student jobs advertised in the newspaper. Students hear that, that's where they think the answer is. They write down newspaper and stop listening. Well, no, they need to be encouraged to, re to listen on because it, later he says, I saw my job for a bus driver on the internet, so I applied. And that is the answer, not newspaper. Newspaper is a distractor. Here's another example from the same listening. The next question, Chris is studying mm, at university. Look straight at the script and you'll see there studying tourism at university. The same words are used in the script. Students hear tourism, they'll write tourism in. Unless they've been told to listen very carefully and to expect distractors like this. Because the answer here is in fact, of course, history because he said my subjects history. So that's very tricky, that one, because they hear the actual words that are in the question, studying at university, and the word, it seems so easy just to put the word tourism in. Let's just talk, I'll talk a little bit more about distractors just in a second. That script there, three minutes, 40 seconds, they're usually about four minutes to get these distractors in. So they're usually longer, uh, usually four minutes rather than three. Uh, and again, as with the part four, they're fairly evenly spaced answers. Uh, most of those are between 50 and 60 words apart, which translates as about 15 to 30 seconds, 20 to 30 seconds, which is just enough time for students to listen, to hear the answer, to hear the distractor, to write their answer, and then move straight on to the next uh, question. Because here, unlike part four, there is no interviewer to signal a change. Here it's a monologue. It's always a monologue in part two, which has its own challenge there. And look here at the distractors. Those are the distractors we saw. Internet, newspaper was a distractor for internet, tourism for history. Here are the remaining questions. And you'll see there that nearly all of the questions have a distractor. In this one, there are eight uh, questions, possibly nine. Uh, number seven doesn't have a distractor. Number eight has a kind of distractor weapons. It's not very tempting. But all the other ones, look in particular at number 10, every time there's a month in the answer, they're usually here more than one month and have to decide. And since 2015, part two listings have usually had between seven and 10 distractors. Seven, eight, or nine, or 10 of the 10 questions have a distractor. So work with part two. It's not simply listening for a word that fits into the gap. It's listening for the word and being able to distinguish it from the other distractor, from the from the other uh, distractor in in the listening there. Okay, um, lots of work needed on looking at scripts. So once again, students should know when to stop concentrating on a question. Well, they should, in this part two at least uh, know that they need to be alert all the time. And distractors shouldn't be distracted by individual word phrases and words in parts one, three, and four, and also, of course, part two. So lots of work needed there in the classroom on looking at scripts, uh, making students aware of distractors and how these listenings are put together, giving them an understanding of the exam. As you can see, we're going to move on to reading now. Um, and I'm going to start by showing you uh, something from the handbook, a piece of advice from Cambridge. And it's just a minute, having a bit of problem there. And it seems to have frozen on me, sorry. Oh, there it is, okay, right. Okay, dealing with unknown vocabulary. I'll just have a little bit of drink and then I'll let you to a drink of water and you can read what it says there.
Okay, guessing the meaning of unknown words from context. This is very, very important for the reading paper, and particularly so in part five, which is something you'll know is the uh, multiple choice reading. And what I've got here is um, uh, some extracts from, uh, from a practice book, a Cambridge practice book, on a text about the Isle of Muck. And the words in blue are those words which I wouldn't expect your average uh, B2 student to know or to be able to use actively. Uh, and in fact, some might say they're, they're C, C1 uh, level words. But these are in a, in a first certificate reading. Let's have a look. Crouches, creeps, gale, steep cliff, the howling wind rage as it might. Nodding, he yells. Very descriptive vocabulary, dumping rain, rain drifting towards us, stride along, he brings me up to speed. Nothing to do with speed there, but uh, letting somebody know the latest on, on an issue. Uh, notice the use of uh, verbs of movement there, striding, creeping, crouching. Herding the sheep, uh, a flock of sheep, drips disappointment, hop off, tapping their boots glowing fire, and there's one you can't see there, perhaps I'll just, there it is, longed for at the bottom. Um, so there's a lot of vocabulary that they probably won't know in that one reading. So this is one of the challenges of the reading paper, how to negotiate this kind of vocabulary, what to do with it. Um, okay, I'm going to show you a little activity here with about uh, or addressing this issue of guessing unknown words from context, um, which is a little bit, it's a similar thing to something you might have seen already, but a slight difference. What I've done is blank out the difficult words. This is a text that I've written uh, for, a, for a forthcoming uh, publication, which I'll say no more about. And uh, it's about a, a family visit of mine last year. My, myself and my family went to Scotland and we um, booked an afternoon with a local guide to go on what's called a Wild West Safari to see some of the local uh, wildlife. And this is a, a part five reading. And I've included there some words which I know students uh, will have problems with or, or at least will not know. But I've blanked them out to show that actually you can guess the general meaning without the word there. Let's have a look. On the hour, a minibus with the words Wild West Safaris mm, on its side pulls into the car park. And students tell me that it's something to do with written. And that really is the meaning of the word that's missing from the gap. It's written on its side. And then you can reveal the actual word that was used, emblazoned. Uh, emblazoned, which means written in a noticeable way. Um, but they were able to tell me that the word has something to do with written. And, and blanking out the word means they're not distracted by the word itself, but are focusing on the meaning of the sentence and trying to come up with the general idea of the meaning there. So it's a new take on, a different take on a, on a, a skill that you've hopefully practiced with your students in class. And out steps Ian something from ear to ear it's difficult not to warm to his cheerful, friendly manner. So he's cheerful, he's friendly. What goes from ear to ear? Well, it's a smile, he's smiling, and they'll tell you, they'll be able to see from this context that the word has something to do with smiling, and the actual word is beaming. We go, we go on, we all seem to him from the start. Well, we're told he's cheerful, he's got a friendly manner, so we're probably gonna like him from the start. And that's what students say here, something to do with like. <clears throat> and the actual expression used here is hit it off with him from the start. And the final one, uh, <clears throat> this is particularly reassuring since no one else has mm, today's safari, reading to the end, it's just the five of us in the nine seater minibus. So something about no one else has decided to come, and that's the general meaning. The actual language used was signed up for. OK, so doing work on unknown vocabulary is very important, particularly for part five. Um, the words, let me, you should also reassure students that the words, the difficult words are either guessable 
or ignorable. They, you can either guess them from context or they can be ignored. They're not, they're not going to be important to the general meaning of the text or to the questions that they're answering. Uh, there are, of course, sometimes questions that do test language in the text, which say, what is the meaning of mm, in line number whatever, 44? And they're given options as to the meaning of that word or expression. And from context, they're expected to work it out. But there's lots of other unknown vocabulary which they have to negotiate in the text. And as I say, it can either be guessed from context or ignored. And here's an example which I'll, oh, sorry, before I go on to that, just uh, this this is the actual van that we got into, the minibus with the words Wild West, not exactly emblazoned, but written in big letters, certainly on the side. And there's the man himself, Ian MacLeod, who was our guide in his lovely native Scotland. Recommendable. OK, so here's an extract from the handbook um, from a part five, part five reading. And let's just have a look at this to illustrate a point. As we drew closer, he became clearer. He was actually a young man rather than a boy. Although he was on the small side, he wasn't as mm, as I'd first thought. He wasn't exactly muscular, but he wasn't mm, either. Now, using this technique again, we can see that probably that first gap has a similar meaning. The word there has a similar meaning to the small. Uh, although he was on the small side, he wasn't as mm, as I'd first thought. And the word actually used is slight, which is small and, and, and weak as well. But generally, students will be able to tell you that the, the missing word there has some kind of similar meaning to small. And with the next gap, the opposite is true. He wasn't exactly muscular, but he wasn't something either. We're going to expect a word which has the opposite meaning of uh, muscular. Uh, and the answer or the word that's used in the text is weedy looking. So students can guess the meaning of those words in that part of the text. And this part of the text is actually tested. Let's have a look at the question. What do we learn about Kathleen's reaction to the boy? She realized, and this is the answer, she realized her first impression of him was inaccurate. And actually, if you look closer at the text, you realize that you actually don't need to understand the meaning of slight or weedy looking for this question. Because with he wasn't as mm, as I'd first thought, we know that that means she realized her first impression of him was inaccurate. It could be any word in there you like, and the answer will still be the same. So the point is here, yes, the words are uh, guessable from context. And no, they're not really necessary to, to understand or to answer that question. So looking at questions like this, looking at, at vocabulary and text, demystifying it for students, holding their hand, reassuring them that this vocabulary, even though there was a, a large amount in that particular text we looked at at the beginning, uh, they don't need to be too frightened of it. They need to be able to deal with it by knowing that they can either guess the meaning or ignore it to answer the questions they're going to be dealing with. This is a B2 level, not C1. OK, so looking at this kind of uh, extract will help to reassure them. Um, OK, use of English um, is the last section I'm going to look at. And um, I'm going to start by looking at, uh, we'll come back to the open close towards the end. Start with the multiple choice close. Um, and I'm going to show you a, another one from the uh, handbook here. That's this one here. First for schools handbook this time, page 12. Have a look at the, the, the language in red. The word in bold is the actual correct word which fitted into the gap. So I've got there eight sentences or eight extracts, and each of the words in bold was the word that students needed to choose from the multiple from the four uh, options that they were given. And you'll see in this particular one, there is a, a very, very heavy emphasis on collocation. Six of those at least deal with collocation. The ones in red, gave his first public performance, enrolled himself in classes, attracted attention, gain experience, lead roles, set himself the goal of. Uh, groups of words um, are tested very much in this particular one here. There are others there. Of course, there's a phrasal verb they're tested. The second one there, helping out. And there's the word range, which is uh, probably together with words of a similar meaning. And in fact, in the same handbook, uh, in the next 
um, example, because there are always two examples of multiple of, of each paper in the handbooks. Uh, here's a couple of examples of words which are not collocations, but words with similar meanings. Dinosaurs regularly combined, gathered, concentrated, united near huge rivers. They're choosing the word with which will fit into the gap. Words with a similar meaning, the same with the next one. So it's not always about collocation, of course. It can be about words with similar meaning, phrasal verbs, the grammar of words. It can be linkers as well. But it's the kind of language that we can prepare students for for this uh, part of the paper and for other parts of the paper. Collocation, um, vocabulary, which can be used here or which we've tested here and which can be used in their writing and even their speaking. Um, so the simple answer to that one, the, the, the simple activity there is get your students to read. And before you throw your arms up in horror and say, yes, but my students don't read, that's the same here in uh, Spain as well, same in many places. Students don't read and therefore don't get the benefit of uh, coming across lots of uh, different vocabulary. Of course, they do watch Netflix and that's an advantage for the listening. But when it comes to reading, uh, no, uh, in Spain it's the same. They don't do a lot of reading. But you do have a very important source of reading material and that's your course book. And the course book, quite, not only the texts, but also your listening scripts once again can come in here to help you and, and give you that little bit or give students that little bit of ex more exposure to, to vocabulary to prepare for this kind of uh, task. So we've used some scripts in this uh, session and I'm going to use them now to show you how in subsequent lessons you can use those same scripts for vocabulary, uh, teaching, testing uh, and gathering uh for for students so here's the first one this is the one uh the listening i have my critics but the evidence from research i've done backs up my argument and yeah backs up is a very nice piece of language the kind of language you might find in a multiple choice um and there what i've done is create my own multiple choice exercise from the material that i have to hand the material in my course book um Looking further down, if you look at anyone who's arrived, reached, risen, climbed a higher level, words similar, but there's a collocation there. Let's have a look at the answers. Backs up my argument, reached a high level, building up to it, reached the same conclusions. Similar to the kind of language we saw in that multiple choice close. And there it is in your listening script, ready to be harvested and recorded by your students. So you can get even more mileage from your um, listening scripts. Look at the, look at the uh, distractors, look how they're constructed. And then in later lessons, see how much of the vocabulary that, that's come up in that listening, uh, the students are, are, have, have noticed and how much they uh, are aware of from that. And, and therefore building up their vocabulary uh, records. Here's another example. This is multiple choice options. There are other possibilities. Here's the... Um, one which I said was my own lis listening, which I was piloting, uh, gapping only one word class. So in this one, I've gapped just some verbs, which are interesting. And these are the verbs that I've gapped. It draws you in, a book you can't put down, the actors do their best. Again, collocation, expressions, groups of words, a series set in the 1920s. So that's another option you can do is to gap rather than multiple choice, just gap the verb without giving them options. And you can also use your scripts to uh, prepare for the open close, for example, by gapping words here. This one here is the uh, part two listening we, we listen to. And I've gapped out the kind of words we might expect in an open close. Uh, what life used to be like, studying tourism at university, in fact, what I did do, there's a tricky one, what I did do, this use of an auxiliary, but uh, take it from me that this kind of auxiliary is actually tested at, at level B2 sometimes. And we'll see an example in a minute in the open close. The point here to leave you with is, is on this point here is using your course books as a rich source of uh, finding vocabulary. And then Cambridge say this in the handbook, students should develop an efficient personal system for recording the new vocabulary they learn. Record as much detail as possible. OK, uh, what does that mean? Well, at the very least, 
for example, back something up or someone up, the meaning and translation. But really in that, uh, the, sorry, the translation there, of course, in Spanish, um, really what, what will help their memory is the context. Putting the example that they saw that piece of language in recording that sentence. I have my critics, but the evidence from research I've done backs up my argument. That's how they saw it. That's how they heard it. And then putting in brackets the listening from the exam handbook about what makes a champion sports person. The, the place they originally saw that. That will is a very, very strong aid to memory, the, the, the context they saw the language in. You can also record the grammar, it's a phrasal verb, so what's the grammar of the phrasal verb? They can record other collocates, so we've got backing up my argument, um, opinion, and so on. You can record pronunciation, but it's not really an issue here. But being realistic, we know that students, or at least the ones that I come in contact with, are not brilliant at keeping vocabulary records. But if they are going to write something down in their record, at least try to record the context they saw it in, as it really will help memory. OK, uh, final thing, really, open close, back to the open close. Um, we looked at uh, before about how what one level of difficulty is the, the, the sense of the, the point that they need to read the whole context sometimes. Uh, their answer will change if they read right to the end of the sentence or the sentence before. Uh, just to point out in, in this uh, one here, again from a handbook, that often those words that are put in there are, are part of a group of words or a grammatical context. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, let's have a look. The first one, since. Well, it's part of a present, a past perfect, sorry, um, and it belongs in that grammatical context. Took is the answer there to that one. Took a long time, part of a group of words. Rather, rather than, set off from. Okay, they, they need to know the word that goes in the gap and it's part of that uh, expression, set off from, it's a phrasal verb. Next one, Columbus didn't succeed in finding. So uh, the, the here is dependent on that uh, verb and the gerund after it, and then, did manage, well, this is another example of that auxiliary verb, just pointing this out to you, because it can be quite tricky sometimes. Didn't succeed in finding the spy signs, but did manage to discover the Americas. There, uh, it goes hand in hand with what comes at the beginning of the sentence, the contrast with didn't succeed. Very tricky for students. And then the final ones came across after, uh, soon after and for sale. So again, worth pointing out that these words, as well as the overall context, have this grammatical, lexical context that they belong to. And also notice numbers 9 and 14, where we have these not grammar words so much as lexical words here, took and came. And also both, of course, requiring the past tense. So it's not only do students have to realize that they need a, a full verb here, but also a verb which is put into the past. Two things to think about. And these, uh, whilst many people think the open close is about grammar, yes, it is about grammar, but it's also about lexis. And these kind, you'll notice here, this text here of just eight gaps, two of those are taken up with words, content words like took and came. Here are some other examples from other exams that I've seen from since 2015. Keep on, known as, coming from, using the uh, participle there. Mistakes are made give it a go, putting it off, phrasal verb, put their ideas into practice. So these verbs like put, come, give, go, get, make, do, are very frequently tested in these. Students need to be aware that that's a possibility. Um, in this one, which is from uh, the latest practice book, practice book three from Cambridge, there are no fewer than three such verbs, and they are questions 13, 14, and 16, so close together, spends, take, and enjoy. So well, some aspects of grammar come into that, but notice it's very much lexis, um, frequent. And in your handout, there's a, a little exercise. I'll put the answers in here, but an exercise that you can do with your students to alert them to the type of words they're going to find in the open close. Um, they're grouped in, in pairs, prepositions and phrasal verbs. You have uh, on her own and look after and then conjunctions and negatives because and not and so on different types of grammatical words and then at the end number six verbs i've heard a lot about the novel 
Rebecca. So I decided to give it a try and known as Lady Browning. So that's another category there. This type of exercise, those of you who use my book, Straight to First and Ready to First, will, will know this kind of exercise. They're in those course books. Uh, if you use those course books and if you don't use those course books, here's an alternative that you can use. It's on the handout. Uh, you could do one at the beginning of the year and one at the end to remind them of the types of words they're going to find in the open close test. OK, nearly finished. Uh, just one last thing to leave you with. Um, just point of interest, really. Uh, items tested in more than one, often uh, a, a piece of language is tested in, can be tested in many different ways. And I've found this one, interestingly, apart from tested in a multiple choice close there from a Cambridge exam. Or the open close, this time the word from is gapped. And even in the keyword transformation there, Nikki is the only person who has, and notice there, signed up for the trip. There's that piece of language we saw coincidentally before uh, in the reading about that I've written about Scotland. But interestingly, the more you do of that kind of looking for language, the more that language will pop up in different uh, situations, particularly if you're using texts in a B2 course book. Uh, they're at that level, and so the language you would expect to find there could be useful at that level. And there, this is a piece of language which we plucked out of that uh, reading before. And then the answer, apart from Nikki, nobody has put their name down. Actually, something to say here about keyword transformations before I finish, that often two pieces of language are tested. And here you've got apart from is tested, and then nobody has put their name down, the expression put their name down. Students have to come up with that uh, put in the right tense, has put. So actually two, three things going on in that transformation. So do uh, notice or tell your students to give them an understanding of what's going on, that often more than one piece of language is tested, not always, but very often, and they should look very carefully at both sentences to make sure that they've included all elements of that first sentence in the second one. And finally, just this, uh, I've used lots of extracts from Cambridge First handbooks and First for Scores, and I've, I've been asked by Cambridge to uh, acknowledge the fact that I've use their material to illustrate this to you and, and really to show you that I've used material which is readily available and you too can use the same material to, to uh, use some of those techniques and procedures that I've commented on here. Okay, I'm going to come out of the uh, session now, out of the presentation and show myself again. And there I am. Okay. Right, that was uh, slightly over, five minutes over. I'm open to uh, questions now. And uh, let's have a look. Um, OK, I've got a question about writing here. Some general, yeah, OK, interesting. General advice for the writing paper. Yeah, I have got some general advice for the writing paper. Because one of the things I do with this class in the uh, that I teach in, in Madrid uh, I don't have a lot of time with them because they also have a school syllabus to deal with. Uh, so I don't have a lot of time to deal with uh, uh, first certificate writing. So I'm just going to write something on a piece of card here, which I use. Uh, not very well. I'm not writing it very well. And it's the word. There we are. Oh, no, it's come back to front. Well, it's come back to front for me. Hopefully that's the right way around. I'm not sure if it is. Valor which is Spanish for courage or value. And um, I'll come on to the Italian version in a minute, actually, because a thought has just occurred to me. So you've got V. This is really a checklist of what they need to include in their writings and also what they need to check their writings for when they've finished to ensure that they've included all the elements that Cambridge are looking for in a, in a decent first certificate writing. So the V, I ask them if they know what these letters stand for. V, they always say vocabulary. Well, yeah, it is vocabulary, but actually it's variety of vocabulary and variety of structures. So the V, I put this on the board, yeah, and they tell me what they think each letter means. V for variety, including variety of structures, variety of tenses. If they're doing the for schools version and they're writing a story, then they'll need a variety of past tenses and variety of vocabulary, not repeating the same vocabulary, but looking for alternatives. A, 
A should be at the beginning because A is answer the question. Make sure you read the question, underline keywords in the question and answer it because uh, content accounts for 25% uh, of the mark. So if you're not answering the question and including all the content points, you're going to lose marks, uh, as they say in Spanish, tontamente, which means in a stupid way. So V, variety, A, answer the question, L, and they usually get that one, linkers, because their teachers tell them that they need uh, to use linkers. And linking, well, linking is a little bit more than just link, linkers. It's also pronouns um, and could be repetition or avoiding repetition, substitution. But anyway, for, the, for as, a, as a quick uh, rule of thumb and a ready checklist, linking, linkers is fine. O is organization and that's paragraphing uh, because students here tend to write one paragraph unless they're told not to. And it's also planning, uh, planning, planning before they write and make, making sure they're planning in uh, paragraphs as well. R is register, uh, making sure they've chosen the correct register. They usually do that fine in Spain. It's not an issue. Uh, I've taught in Eastern European, country, Eastern European countries, and there it was often a problem that people were writing too formally. But generally uh, in Spain and probably in Italy, well, I don't find this much of a much of a, a problem. Register. Thinking about your situation, you need an Italian word, and yes, you've guessed it. The word is valore, and the e there very conveniently, very conveniently, uh, can stand for well, errors. When you've written your writing, check it through for errors, for mistakes. Um, so valore, put it on the board uh, before they do their writings, just to remind them before they do their homeworks. And also as a checklist after they finish writing their homework and also in the exam when they're planning and when they're checking their writing. OK, that's something on uh, writing there. Useful for me, useful for my students, and hopefully that's useful for you. Probably you've Possibly you've got your own ideas for that. Uh, that's mine. OK. Um, OK, uh, perhaps time for one more question re reading. Yeah, I did. OK, I said something about uh, reading part five, but nothing about part uh, six and part seven. Um, well, part seven, pretty much like the uh, listening gets analyze have get have a look choose one yourself analyze it and you'll notice in part seven which is the multiple matching reading uh, there's a lot of paraphrasing in fact this is a, a session that i've done in the past um in fact when i went to italy i think if you saw me there a couple of years ago i think i was talking about paraphrasing then paraphrasing is so so important in the the first exam Speaking specifically about reading, because that was a question, well, in part uh, seven, the multiple matching, some of the questions, not all of them, but some of the questions uh, are, or the prompts, call them questions, prompts, are paraphrases of what's in the text. And actually, sometimes the question is has more difficult language than the language in the text itself, which is a bit strange. Paraphrasing comes in there. Paraphrasing is tested directly in transformations. We've seen that. Students are encouraged to paraphrase in the speaking if they don't know uh, the word. So paraphrasing comes into speaking. If you don't, can't think of the word, paraphrase. Perfectly acceptable at level B2. Not so much at proficiency at C2, but certainly at uh, B2. Paraphrasing comes into the writing. We just mentioned writing variety. Uh, you want to be able to uh, avoid repetition. So saying the same thing in different ways. Paraphrasing is there. Uh, is there something I haven't mentioned? Uh, if I have, well, listening as well. Sorry, listening questions as well often includes paraphrasing. Not all the time, but it's certainly an element uh, there. Look out for that. Prepare your students for it. I have exercises on that in Ready for First. It's a, a skill which needs developing. Uh, you can quite simply integrate, integrate it into your classrooms classes by just occasionally stopping when you're dealing with a text or whatever piece of language and say, What's another way of saying that in English? Or alternatively, giving them a piece of language. OK, here's an expression in the first paragraph. What expression in the first paragraph has the same meaning as the one that I've just written on the board or the one I'm telling you now? Make paraphrasing part of your lessons because it's so important in the reading, but also all the other papers as well. 
As far as the gap text is concerned, part six, um, then, well, uh, I, the advice that I give in, in, in my books is the advice to follow. Just a couple of pointers there. Make sure your students read the base text, the text with the gaps without the options first. Make sure they read it all the way through. And if they feel uh, level-headed enough and don't get too nervous in the exam, get them to try and predict what goes in the gaps. It takes a bit more time, but by trying to predict what goes in the gaps, pretty much as we did with the guessing the meaning of vocabulary from context, will help them uh, much better put the, the, the missing sentences into those gaps if they already thought about the possible type of sentence that will go in the gap there. OK, predicting what's going to come up in the gap. OK, I'm looking at time. We've uh, reached an hour. Um, no time for any more questions, I'm afraid. And um, I'll hand back to it's been well, firstly, it's been wonderful here talking to you. I can't see you. You can see me, uh, but uh, lovely to talk to you. And it would be nicer, of course, to be in Italy, uh, but uh, a great privilege to, to be talking to so many people and look out for the handout. So I'm going to hand back to Luca or Silvia. Are you there? Awkward silence. No, they're coming. They're coming. Yeah. Hi, <laughs> Norris. Ryan, thank you. Thank you so much. So um, we had interesting questions, and I think you know it was very well perceived, your webinar. So thank you. My pleasure. And, uh, thank you. I, I will make sure to invite you to Italy again, OK? Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> it was exactly yeah. two years ago this week, so. Yeah. Ah, right. <laughs> OK, OK. Oh, well, then. Right. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you.